to today's GLA Oversight Committee. Um, can I welcome members, officers and the public, both here in the chamber and those watching um, the webcast at home. Can I remind everyone, please, to turn your mobile phones and other devices to silent um, or switch them off. Please don't put them on vibrate because the microphones pick that up as well. Um, can I ask the clerk to confirm any apologies for absence today? Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies for absence have been received from Assemblymember Deval, for whom Assemblymember Cooper is attending virtually as a substitute. And we've also had apologies from Assemblymember Russell, for whom Assemblymember Polanski is attending as a substitute for today. Lovely. Welcome, Assemblymember Polanski, to your first GLA oversight meeting. And welcome, Assemblymember Cooper, as well, um, remotely. And um, we have agreed amongst the group leaders that we can allow Assemblymember Cooper to take part today because she's substituting for Assemblymember Duval. So thank you for that. Item two, members, declarations of interest. Can we note the list of officers held by Assembly members? And are there any other disclosures? pecuniary interests that people wish to make today. No, we agree Noted. that. Um, item three, summary list of actions. Can we note the completed and ongoing actions arising from previous meetings of the Oversight Committee? Noted. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, this brings us on to item four, London and Partners and GLA Governance. This is our main item um, today, which is a two-part question and answer session with London Partners beneficiaries in relation to overseas visits and trade delegations. Um, so we're in our first um, session, and I'm delighted we're joined by four people who've been uh, taken part in London and Partners um, trade missions. And we have in the chamber Chris Scattergood, who's the CRO and founder of Fundamental VR. Welcome today. And we've got Melinda Nicky, founder and chief executive officer of Baby to Body. Welcome. And then online virtually, I, I can't look at you in your face directly, but we have got Dr. Ellen Half Davies, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Aparito. Welcome. And Kim Rehal, who's co founder of Equal Education. So thank you very much indeed for um, joining us today for this discussion. And this is the third of three meetings we're having looking into the governance at London and Partners and the GLA, particularly in relation to overseas visits and trade delegations. And the purpose of today's session is for the committee to discuss and understand from ben how beneficiaries became involved with London and Partners and the GLA, what impact that involvement had on their business, and any issues relating to access to GLA sponsorship and um, mayoral trade missions. And just for the benefit of those watching, just to remind everyone, it's not permissible for the committee to purport to be investigating a breach of the Code of Conduct for it to draw any conclusions about whether conduct amounted to a breach of the Code of Conduct or to give the impression that it is disciplining the former Mayor of London. So just to make sure that's absolutely clear. So um, I will open up the questions and what I'd like to ask um, each of you just briefly, can you give us some background about what your organisation um, is and what it does? Perhaps I go to you first, um, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, my company is called Fundamental VR. We are virtual reality um, creators. Uh, we specialise in the healthcare industry, uh, and in particular in training surgeons and other healthcare practitioners uh, to perform difficult or complex procedures and how to rehearse those um, and, um, uh, and kind of go through a process of learning and measurement in virtual reality. And we do that for uh, a number of life science companies around the world uh, from um, some of the big names you know in pharmaceuticals um, such as Novartis through to uh, equipment manufacturers for use in orthopaedics etc. Thank you. Perhaps I come to you next, um, Melinda. Sure, yes, um, hi everyone. My name is Melinda Nikki, CEO and founder of baby to body um, baby to body is a women's wellness platform and essentially what we do is we provide personalized guidance for women through um, their conception journey, pregnancy and postpartum. So it's a way for them to get personalized advice and guidance based on their specific data points. So we look at who that woman is, what stage of the journey she's at, we get a lot of different health data points from her and then in real time we give her wellness programs. So fitness, nutrition, and mental health programs and support right through that whole period and we're actually um, expanding now into the perimenopause and menopause so we've renamed the company called it's called now called body collective 
and we're bringing out the perimenopause and menopause a uh, similar product to support women through this journey, um, enabling their health and wellness. And that's called Embody, and that's coming out too. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Dr. Davies, could I come to you next? Um, could you tell us a little bit about your, your Hi. Thank you. I'm Ellen Hav Davis, I'm the CEO of Aparito. We're a supporting um, clinical trial, remote patient monitoring. So Support the enrollment, recruitment, and retention of patients through patient generated data. Uh, more recently, um, have been supporting patients uh, post COVID as well. So, thank you. Lovely, thank you. And Kim. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Rehal, the co founder and co CEO of Equal Education. Um, we educate children using specialised tutoring programmes. Um, so, children who are in care those who have um, special educational needs and disabilities and adopted children. Um, we have been doing so for the last nine years, working with such vulnerable children, and um, we do that using 600 qualified teachers. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. And um, in the same order again, how did your organisation become involved with London and Partners and the GLA? Chris. Um, so um, I was working from home one day and I saw uh, Sadi Khan being interviewed on TV. Uh, I don't forget, I don't remember the actual incident. Something happened in London, it may have been a terror attack, but he was being interviewed whilst he was in New York and he was being questioned, why are you in New York when these things are going on at home? And, and he gave a very good answer that was about how he needed to uh, keep the London economy growing and he was spending a lot of time ensuring that businesses got access into New York markets and that London businesses were being developed. Uh, and as he talked about the programme that he was running, I thought it was particularly interesting to us as we were expanding into the US. Uh, and so I looked into it online uh, and found London Partners and started the conversation there. So that's how I got into it in that case. I hadn't heard of London and Partners before that, but you saw something the mayor said and, and looked into it yeah i looked at um uh, the, the whole program the mayor's business program and, and what it was and then we went through a recruitment process which involved interviewing us um trying to understand more about us our company our products our target markets uh, and a kind of a, a an assessment project on whether or not we were a suitable company to become part of the program um and that was with London and Partners staff? Yes. And what year roughly was this? Was this? I'm going to say 2017. Right. I think okay. thereabouts. Um, so we've been on a number of different trade missions and done a number of different projects with different organisations. But I, I'm fairly certain it would be 2017. Okay. Possibly 2016, late. Okay, lovely. Thank you. And Melinda? Yeah, I was involved with Tech London Advocates and I um, started a health tech you know, uh, competition and at one of the events that I had put on I met um, someone who had been involved with London and were, were, had been on a trade mission so that's the first time I'd heard of it and then uh, we were part of the Wire Accelerator in central London with uh, part of Telefonica and it, I think it was the demo day in 2016. I met someone from London and Partners who then said we would potentially be a good candidate for the program and that we should apply. So um, I looked it up online and then applied and went through it. And then by the time we actually went on anything, I think it was about six months later, because I think at that point we were too early in our stage of business. Um, so we had to provide, you know, how many staff we had, um, all of our um, metrics in terms of, you know, how many people had signed up on the platform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then um, by the time we went on our first um, trip or, or got involved, it was the middle of seventeen. Um, so yeah, that was my experience. You, but um, so you went to. Um, Tech London. Yeah, Tech London Advocates is uh, run by Rush Shaw. It's a it's an advocacy program for um, for London, um, for the technology sector, and um, I was involved with that on a pro bono basis. It's just a networking. Yes. Um, for, uh, you know. And London and really. partners were at that or part of that? Um, there was someone there from, no, they were just attending an event, just like I was basically. Well, I'd put on the event, but they were just attending. 
But you said there was somebody you spoke to at that who'd been on a trade mission. So yes, company. yeah, there was someone from London Partners and someone who'd been on a trade mission. I can't remember who it was, yeah. but I heard good things, um, and it sounded like it made a difference to their business. Um, so I was intrigued, and then found out more. And we weren't really at the right stage. So yeah. by the time we were, then we we kind of reapplied the next year, and then we were accepted. Obviously, you were turned down the first time. We were told we needed different metrics, yes. So essentially we were turned down, yeah. No, no, that's fine. That's really helpful. Thank you. And let's go to um, Dr. Davies online. Hi, yes. I had quite a similar experience to Melinda in many ways. I mean, I heard about uh, London Partners uh, through uh, the, my network. And the first time I applied, we were told that we, we you know, were not big enough yet. So we need to increase our revenue and staff size in order to... To, to qualify, so we therefore came back a year later and applied again uh, before we were considered sort of uh, large enough or, or um, suitable for the program at that time. And we went for our uh, first sort of mission, as they call them, in 2017, uh, three since uh, since I did. Okay. Um, can I just check, Dr. Davies, where you? only part, taking part in trade missions or were you also aware that there was were potential for sponsorship opportunities for events and things was that part of your discussions with london and partners the sort of opportunities no, provided? The, the only thing that i informed of was the trade missions i wasn't made uh, aware of it uh, as part of my engagement okay lovely thank you and what about you kim Certainly, my co-founder and I at the time were working in a co-working space and one of their, um, I believe it was the managing director there, actually invited us. So we, it was by invite, and this was probably about four or five years ago now, I guess in the light of the Sadiq era, so to speak. Um, and it was at that time that my co-founder went out on, a, on, a, on his first trade mission to Australia. So, the, so a managing director from London and Partners, you're saying? No, no, I beg your pardon, from a co-working space called Impact Hub. Right, they were aware of it and, ref and referred you? That's right, so it's, um, I guess by invitation or through referral. And were you aware that there were also sponsorship opportunities, potentially for events and things, as well as trade missions? No. You weren't aware of that. Okay, lovely. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a helpful sort of frame that how you've all um, managed to find out about London and Partners. Let me pass you over to Assembly Member Fortune. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, it was interesting getting ready for this meeting, learning about your, your journeys and the, and the great businesses that you've all uh, created. And the absurd amount of rowing that Dr. Davis has done. That was very, very <laughs> impressive. Um, but what, what struck me with the leading there was all of you were talking about how you found out about this opportunity. And it was either uh, word of mouth or seeing an interview on television. So my question would be, what do you think that, that London Partners could do better to publicise this offer so that it reaches other great businesses like yours? Should we, should we go in the same order again, Chair? Is that... I think it's probably easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would imagine being part of the tech infrastructure of London, that, that there's uh, an enormous, or certainly pre-COVID, there was an enormous amount of meetups, uh, meetings, sessions, opportunities uh, to run um, uh, kind of networking sessions and attend them. Um, it sounds like how you got, got into it as well, anyway. So those are the sort of places where you would really go, and I, th I think London Partners probably do that. Um, we, we were, um, I just happened to see something on the TV, but, um, to, which was chance, but I think it would have only been a matter of time before somebody would have uh, appeared at one of the many networking sessions that there are for um, the tech companies that are growing in London. So that was back in 2016, I think you said you saw that. I think it was late two, 2016, early 2017. Yeah. And then I think, Melinda, you said you got involved in 2017, is that right? So would you say, let's go to Melinda now, um, would you say that um, LMP have improved the way that they're communicating or reaching out to, to businesses? Well, I think initially, um, you know, the, the tech industry, say five, six years ago, was a lot less um, sophisticated and developed, and it's obviously grown hugely now. And there's also um, people like us who've been through, you know, trade missions and have had 
a really positive experience and have, you know, the whole program's been instrumental in so many different ways, personally, um, for my company and myself as a CEO and a leader in this in London. So I think that, um, you know, we're the examples of the positive examples and I think that that is crucial really to get, you know, the next generation and up and coming startups involved. So I do, um, I'm on the board of ICE, which is a network just for tech entrepreneurs um, in the UK. And, you know, there's lots of companies that are coming in and finding out about us and it's all through our network. And then, you know, I hear about new things going on with, LM, you know, with London and partners and I, I refer people. So, um, building on that, then if I switch to Dr. Evans, I don't know where to look when someone's on television. <laughs> um, how, since your experience with LMP, um, how have you or your organisation been used to reach out to other people and encourage them to, to apply to get involved? Um, I was asked to provide um, some quotes and experiences, uh, feedback uh, based on the mission, I think, that was then used for, for future reaching out. I would strongly advocate, as we know, that it's hardest to reach female founders and therefore from the female point of view, um, it was great to have that network, that support net networks continue to, to be great and we then pass on the information to other people that, that we are of as well. Okay. Thank you. I missed the, the, the end of that, but I, I think I got the gist of it. So, uh, Kim, just to, just to complete the set, uh, what, what advice could you give to London and Partners to make sure that they were reaching uh, businesses across London? I mean, I'd say London is arguably the world's most promising and best thriving ecosystem. I think I mean, we've certainly experienced that from kind of reports and charity job where there's a huge demand for mission-led jobs. Um, and I think that initially LMP had a bit of a unhealthy focus on fintech and we really wanted to kind of diversify and capture Gen Z um, and really to stop kind of gravitating towards the same pools and networks of privilege. So what actually we did have conversations with them and say, look, you really need to focus on ed education, whether that's ed tech. And, and they actually did listen and put on an ed tech mission, which was wonderful. Um, so I, I think maybe diversifying you know, where they're targeting would possibly be one area. Okay, thank you. That's, that's really interesting because um, we did talk about fintech and the engagement with fintech last week. Um, if I could just go back through in, in reverse order, Kim, could you, could you talk to us about the application process? What is it that you, you went through when you first applied? Uh, so, I'm trying to recall this actually, I think I might have put this on my co-founder. Uh, who, <laughs> who was, uh, did this. <laughs> um, but I do, I do recall then actually um, having continuous conversations there after the application process. Um, but it's by no means a small fate, you know, it's put to quite a lengthy process. And that's from my memory of it. Forgive me, it's been four or five years. No, that, that's fine. Perhaps Dr. Evans, would you put, talk us through your experience? Would you say it was a rigorous process? Yeah, I remember the form being quite lengthy with a lot of extensive details about revenue, investment, staff, um, a lot of focus on financial uh, kind of, um, you know, growth of the company to date. Um, and, and particularly, as, as I say, full time employees that were able to support the founder to take time away from the company for the time they were on the on the um, on the missions etc I would just echo the point previously made that um, you know moving away from fintech into medtech was something that I strongly encouraged as well uh, so just want to add that part if I can. I think Chris would agree with the medtech uh, direction as well um, thanks very much Jeb. mindful of time I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there Fine. Okay. Um, can I just ask if any of you applied for any trade missions with the GLA before 2016? Because obviously you've all been under slightly newer systems since 2016. Um, did any of you apply to try and go on any trade missions before that? Chris will be no because he hadn't heard of it. But anyone else? No, I'm seeing shaking. No. Head. No. No. Okay. No, that's helpful. Um, we're just trying to. Um, catch up if there were any issues there. Um, can I move on to Assembly Member Ahmed? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, panel. 
What, if any, relationships did anyone from your respective organisations have with the Mayor of London or GLA officers at the time of securing a place on the Mayor's International Business Programme? Would you like to answer first? Nothing. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I didn't know anyone. Didn't know the Mayor until, well, the first time I met the Deputy Mayor was on a mission. None. None at all. Yeah, uh, absolutely the same. None. We only, actually only met him on a trade mission together. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to do two as well? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, Again, to all of the panel, what did you set out to achieve from attending a mayoral trade mission? Yeah. Um, well, uh, for us, it was about learning about new markets. So, um, considering there's only 800,000 babies born a year in the UK and 5 million in the US, it's a <laughs> huge market. So, we were focused on expanding our market into different territories and understanding those countries, whether it's um, India or even Europe or the US, is really important to understand you know, the nuances of the market. And there's nothing better than actually going on a trade mission to understand that. And it was instrumental in us making decisions about which markets to expand into and indeed which ones we weren't ready for as well. Um, and we also were able to secure partnerships um, and some interesting kind of um, strategic partnerships and also investment um, through the connections that we made on some of the trade missions. So it was very, you know, th there was a very clear goal and a very clear strategy on why I was taking the time out from the company, but it definitely delivered on all of those aspects. And I think one other thing that is, sorry, I'd just like to add this, is really important, um, is the peer network that we develop and the relationships. So some of the people that I've met on these trade missions are very, very important to my everyday, you know, kind of support network. And as a sole founder, it's really vital to have that kind of, you know, those groups that actually I can get advice from or support from and sometimes bounce ideas on. So that's been really, really helpful uh, as growing as a, as a CEO, really. Thank you. Um, so very similar from our perspective. I think in particular we were, our objective was to get introductions to um, large corporates that would probably pay more attention to a company that was on uh, the mayor's trade mission rather than um, just kind of knocking at the door, trying to flog them latest technology. So that, that was the pure intention to start with, and that in itself was incredibly successful. Uh, we have a number of um, customers that we managed to advance our relationship with as a result of uh, the, uh, the trade missions, in particular uh, a couple in Germany, which is really positive. Um, as well as that, um, side benefits for us then came from um, the, the activity that was ran um, here upstairs and also over in London Partners, which was um, things like uh, advice on dealing with tax and legal issues. So we then were introduced to Dan Glover of WSRG or WFGR uh, as solicitors, and uh, we now have a relationship with them in the US and the UK. They are they're our main counsel. Uh, also with the KPMG team, who gave us some great tax advice and were able to really help us uh, plan out how we would work uh, both in Europe and in the US uh, and other um, various elements of HR advice and, and the kind of um, ad hoc, it sounds unplanned, but a more uh, casual ad hoc type activities that were offered to us as being part of the trade missions that were really very interesting to us in our efforts to expand and grow the business. Thank you. Um, from our side, um, the first uh, kind of mission we were really wanting to be to, be, to large corporates to become our clients. Um, we had mixed success. Um, we probably didn't have enough time 
a more exclusive to a joystick from to, to sort of be able to move it forward, but it was a really great learning curve. Um, what's been more successful, um, much like uh, just said, we were introduced uh, to Daniel Glazer with WSDR, and we've now fully established in the US uh, as Aparito Inc. under their guidance of, of assessing Apple's legal requirements. And since you know establishing there, we've been gaining a lot of business and traction. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. Have you moved your hand over the speak microphone or something? <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just. Sorry, I'm I'm joining you from my holiday, unfortunately. So it's not a great signal, Thank you very unfortunately. Much. Um, I don't know if you, if you That's better, <laughs> if yes. you heard. I was mentioning that um, uh, the the successful part was meeting Daniel Glazer and WSGR. Uh, that's really allowed us to establish a uh, Aparito Inc in the US. And having that footprint in the US has now meant we've really grown in business and won a lot of clients within the US, and that's been a huge success. Thank you. I think it's really important to say, firstly, that the trade missions are quite speculative in nature, but what the wonderful thing is, it takes risks away from uh, companies that are scaling. And I think for us, it was very much about learning about different markets, being how we could make some partners on our difficult mission. Um, our parts are quite difficult and we wanted to learn and be put in touch with international partners. Um, for example, how the Australians work with indigenous children and draw parallels on the contact theory. And really understanding the comparative strengths and weaknesses of the UK compared to the world. So we had the chance to kind of scope opportunities to partner with public institutions abroad and really connect with world-class researchers who are outside of the UK. Um, also a chance to partner with leading charities outside of the UK. Um, and I think this has already been mentioned, but connecting with like-minded London-based startups uh, and develop some strategic alliances. The, um, from a trade mission that occurred four or five years ago, we actually are now working with the Department for Education in Australia, which is quite exciting. Thank you very much. Could you just repeat the very first thing that you said? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that properly. You said something about taking the risk away. Yes, that's right. Um, I, I, sorry, I was mentioning that actually trade missions by their very nature um, are speculative. And I think that when it's planned and organised in such a way, it takes away some of the risk from businesses in terms of how they're planned, in terms of and coordinated and going out to meet with like-minded um, international partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Could I just pick up, particularly um, Chris and Melissa, you talked about almost the kudos of going on one of these trade missions. There's a lot around it. You get access to markets. What are you? And you went through a lot to get on these trade missions, the application process and so on. Were you aware of any, any attendees joining in an unofficial capacity when you were on your trade missions? None at all. Everybody had been through the same um, mill that we had um, and been grilled and uh, just um, like um, uh, as you were saying before um, when Melinda said that she hadn't been successful the first time we weren't immediately successful um, we, uh, our initial application was rejected um, based on the way that our company was set up and what we were doing it's only as we focused more in the healthcare the life sciences uh, work that we were then accepted onto the program so there, there was nobody at all to my knowledge that was it had not been through a similar um, kind of process. Okay, were you, were you ever permitted to bring along other third parties with you on the trade missions you attended? No, that was not something that was discussed at all. No. no. What about you, Melinda? Yeah, the only, um, I was the only person who went from our business and I, I didn't see anyone else, you know, like two people from a company or something. There was only normally the, the CEO or the COO. Yeah. Um, it, it was one place yeah, on a mission. Yeah, it was definitely one place and I didn't meet anyone on any of the missions that um, wasn't connected to the mission, either part of London and partners, the organisers or uh, from a business. From a business who'd been through the same process you had, yes, not just coming correct. along to a few events. and. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, what about um, online? Um, Kim and Dr. Davies, were you um, aware of anyone unofficially attending any of your trade missions? I can certainly say not to my knowledge. No. Same for me, as far as I was aware, not, not at all. And were you aware of anyone bringing other third parties on the trade missions? 
No, it was quite strict numbers. You know, there was only the one numbers. The only other people that were there were sort of sponsor partner uh, uh, staff or, or colleagues from, say, KPMG and stuff. But no, not no. at all otherwise. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Assemblymember Sahota. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, question to all the guests, please. But the question is simply, were these trade uh, missions run effectively, were they managed effectively, and were they well organised? And if you agree they were, why do you say that? We will start with you, Melinda. Um, yes, I think they're generally very well organised. We, um, the communication leading up to um, the trip is always um, in a timely fashion. It sets out uh, agendas so we can do our pre-research in terms of what we want to achieve and who we want to meet. We are also um, we're given an opportunity to say what kinds of people we wanted to meet. So whether it was you know healthcare providers or strategic partners. So we had some input into who would be helpful for us. Um, on one of them, there was also like almost like a wish list of you know if you could meet anyone in San Francisco, who would that be and why? And we had to justify that. Um, so that was collaborative, and I think that that was very useful because it means that it's much more tailored to what we want. And there's you know there's a bigger chance that we'll have um, some kind of success. Um, so that was, I think, really well done. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? Whether you thought it was well organised and, 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 and well run. That's yes, the, and then, and then why you said were, that? Yeah, and then when we were actually on the mission, there was always an agenda. We knew exactly what was going on every single day. We knew ahead of time where we were going. We were able to get, um, you know, like, um, you know, the, the attendees of, of events, and we could then look them up and see if they would be useful for us. So you could have a little kind of game plan of who you wanted to meet and how you were going to. Um, you know, make the best use of your time at the, each of those events. Um, and I think that was always really useful. There was always a structure to them. Um, there was a very clear understanding of, you know, like how many hours a day we would be doing events. And then when there was downtime, and generally in the downtime, we were encouraged to um, send emails to the people we'd met or to, you know, do some research in terms of like going to the next one. So. Um, on the one of the ones to San Francisco that I went on, you know, we had a little bus that took us from one place to the other and in the bus we were told exactly who we were going to see, what they did, you know, we were reminded about things. So it was very well structured. It was almost like, you know, we were taken on this journey and, and it was all laid out for us. So um, definitely a really good use of time and also a lot of respect for our time. And, and, and you, Chris? So, yeah, very, very similar again. Um, I think not having been, uh, the first time we went on a trade mission or got involved in the application, uh, I had a, a misperception that was perhaps this was an opportunity to meet new customers uh, over a glass of champagne in the ambassador's reception or whatever uh, and and possibly there would be some form of support uh, financially in terms of hotels flights etc etc but that wasn't the case and and it was it was really as as we got on to, as I got onto the first mission it kind of opened up in front of me the organization behind it was the real value the networking um, the fact that it was done, as you were saying, in, in such a professional way, so that when, as, as ultimately they do, if you have an agenda of 20 items over two or three days, one of those things will drop out through somebody being ill or something changing, as it does. Um, yet there was, there was a real concerted effort then to fill that gap and to make it a meaningful use of time. So it was really well run, right from the initial process of applying for each mission, uh, and justifying why, what, what was your opportunity in the market, what were your challenges, uh, and how would you address it, and why would it benefit? So there was real scrutiny there, um, right the way through to post-mission, and assessing then, did we meet those objectives? Did we deliver on that? How are we following up? What will we do next? So I, I thought it was really well run, and that's why I felt I should come today to say those things, because um, I know the team put a lot of work in, and uh, we're very grateful for it. Yeah, same. Very grateful. 
and, and guests um, virtually. Kim? Thank you. Um, I would I would agree actually that the, that the event is organised very well. But as I have mentioned previously, there is a huge focus on fintech, and I'm not too sure this could due to the chair's work experience himself. Um, and actually, we've had to really push to kind of support social enterprises. At the end of the day, this is a programme that is focused on international relationships. Um, we obviously work tirelessly to, to foster these relationships. Um, and in particular, I probably want to make reference to a um, two events, actually. One event was having the Victorian state government representatives doing a talk in City Hall. Sadly, there wasn't much support with that. And there wasn't much support for hosting the mayor of Cannes in City Hall either. So I, I think really it would have been useful to, to have that support, given what the, the values and missions of the programme itself is. Um, and actually, we weren't looking for any financial kind of focus there or, you know, this isn't private or invest again. This is a social enterprise trying to benefit the most marginalised children in England. So I think there could have been a little more done there in hindsight. But other than that, I would agree that these trade missions are... They're difficult, you know, and time is limited, and there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure that everyone is getting what they need from it. Good. Thank you. And, and Ellen? Um, I would echo the points made to, uh, to, you know, to, at the moment, and the fact that they were extremely efficient, extremely well organised. Um, if, if anything, my, my thoughts sometimes were that they were cramming in too many things. So, you know, I, I sometimes would have been of the thought that less would have been more um, and spend more time with, with less people, but extremely efficient. Good. Look, thank you very much for giving your feedback. It's been very, well, it's very comforting to hear those things that you found the value was added to your missions. Thank you. Assemblymember Plansky, do you want to pick up Good your chair, and Thank you, panel, for being here, both uh, in person and virtually. Uh, so, Chris, if I can begin with you. Um, you've alluded to the fact that these things were well structured and you're appreciative, uh, and that's why you've come here today. What was the communication and engagement like, both before, during and after, both from LNP and the GLA? Uh, very effective. Um, so we would be, um, let me get it right for you. So once we were as part of the programme then, we would get regular updates of activities that were coming up that may be run here or, or next door. So we would be notified of those things and there'd be a full calendar of activities such as that. And also then, as they were starting to form the trade missions, we would be contacted to say, there's a trade mission coming up, it's going to X town, and it's focused on these things, and we think your company would fit in. These are the kind of things we want to do. Uh, we would have the opportunity, as uh, Linda was saying, to, to then contribute to that and to say, this would really work for us, this would really be beneficial, or we're not interested in this stuff. And we were able to then shape um, what the mission would be if we were to be accepted upon it. So that was really useful. Uh, and then in the run-up to the mission, there was um, the appropriate amount of contact, sharing information, what was going to happen, who we're going to meet, what we're going to be doing. And then afterwards, uh, a proper kind of look at how we'd performed on the mission, how uh, London and Partners had performed for us, um, and a review of what was successful, what could be done differently, better next time what should we do more of, less of, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, th I think it was really well run and, uh, and well done like that. I, I do accept that there's a lot of activity on some of the days, but uh, from our perspective, it, it, it's all about kissing a lot of frogs and uh, seeing which ones turn <laughs> into the appropriate uh, thing. Let me brush your teeth afterwards. <laughs> um, Melinda, um, so you said that they were very respectful of your time. Um, so what was the communication engagement like kind of overall for you? Yeah, really, really good. So we knew um, exactly when trips were coming up. Um, we were given time to apply to them um, to see if they were relevant to us or not. There was a kind of consultation process that I've already spoken about. Um, leading up to the trip, we were always um, told exactly what the agenda was. Um, when there were changes in the agenda, we were given an opportunity to give our bio, bio and photos, so that would be in all of the um, documentation that was given to um, any of the attendees at any of the events. Um, and that was, I mean, that's also a lot of work and um, collaboration and communication. And then during the trip, obviously, there was a huge amount of communication as to what was going on day to day, hour to hour. 
and then um, post the trip there's always a feedback of um, if it was worthwhile or not and then um, after I think one of the trips there was one of the companies we'd met um, in India who came to the UK and then there was they had an event here so we were encouraged to to attend as well and given ample notice of when that was so and then you know there's a regular newsletter that we get with all the events and um, you know the learning opportunities um, that you know even virtually right throughout last year there were things happening so I think they're really good at communicating and just just to add from my perspective as well so it was a one-to-one -one communication there were the newsletters and there were the meetings that were set up and, and calendarized but it was a one-to-one -one relationship so in my case and i assume yours as well it was with alvin, alvin. and remy yeah and he was excellent mm. um and he's somebody that i felt i could pick the phone up to and talk to about what might be coming up um how something might be of benefit to us or to London partners or whatever so it was really well run by him and the team here it's excellent Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Yeah, and just just Sorry. one other thing. I mean, also um, all of that happens, and then um, I think we've been, both been involved in um, giving back and helping other companies coming onto these missions. So there's often a kind of panel event before some trade missions in order to find out how to best make the best use of your time on the trade mission. So I've been on, on quite a few of those panels, just giving tips and advice to new businesses coming in on you know how to maximize the um the efficacy and the success rate of of going on one of these trade missions so <laughs> that's something else that happens quite a lot Brilliant. thank you um if i can turn virtually then uh, to ellen um we've lost you but i think we can still hear you uh, just to repeat the question was what the engagement and communication was like both before during and after uh with the gla and lmp uh, my main communications was with the LMP and it was, uh, you know, as already said, really uh, individual and personal and, and professional. I really want to mention, um, you know, the ongoing supports uh, informally and not just formally has been invaluable, particularly from Janet. Um, and it sort of made you made you feel you have a, a, a real professional um, and valuable uh, resource that you can rely on. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Kim, uh, the same question. Certainly. I'm just going to split that into two, if I may, and try to comment on London and Partners. Um, they've been absolutely fantastic in the lead up to trade missions, in particular, uh, Sarah French and Orban. Uh, obviously, credit to, to Janet. Um, and again, you know, lots of communication, ensuring they've got our details, they're publicising the company and, and, and what we do. Um, and again, during the actual trade missions themselves, I would say very excellent communication, you know, setting up conversations with, with everyone who's partaking. Um, I have to say, sadly, post trade missions, there, there isn't the integration and support that I would probably expect and, and communication there is probably an area that could be developed and built upon. And if I made a comment about the GLA, um, I did allude to this in a previous um, question that actually we managed to get government representat representatives sorry, from uh, Victoria, Australia, and unfortunately we didn't get any support from the GLA, which is rather disappointing, um, as well as the mayor of Cannes, again, communication, just, we just didn't get any communication back. Whilst someone did support us in securing the top floor of City Hall for the event, that there sadly wasn't communication. Thanks, Kim, and sorry to hear that. And can I just clarify, when you say there wasn't integration and support, what, what specifically are you referring to, or what would you like to see? Sure, I think follow-ups, how, how is the business growing? Uh, how about we have some sort of check-in or conversations? Um, I think that'd be really useful, um, not probably more so than just obviously a feedback survey, because actually something like international relationships, they take time to build upon. And I think it'd be really useful, not only for them, but also for us, to follow that trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, panel, and thanks, Chair. Um, Assemblymember Hall. Thank you. Actually, my, my first question has really been covered. It's about the governance arrangements and feedback, and you've all told us your various views on feedback, and thank you for that, because that is interesting. One thing that I will ask, you seemed, all of you, to find out by chance about London and partners and, the, and getting on this, um, these various schemes. Did you receive any personal or recorded advice as to why you were 
eventually what 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 was the correct fit what it was that you did that was the correct fit was there anything specific i think um for from my experience there were there was criteria so you had to meet the criteria and that was a number of employees um revenue um growth rate either in revenue or in um in some other um, metrics so if you met those uh, criteria then you were you were able to apply so it was still an application process but those were the minimum criteria and that was um that was very clearly communicated right at the beginning okay. and that's why we didn't meet the criteria initially okay um chris yeah same here and i believe that they were particularly uh, interested in us because we had a a new emerging technology that had the ability to reach on a global level uh, and with it, the product being developed in London. So it clearly had a positive impact on, on London jobs. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Davis? Um, same here in terms of metrics of revenue or investment or staff. Um, I think what was more challenging, I alluded to earlier, was at the time when we were trying to get, there wasn't necessarily so many opportunities for med tech, uh, but then that did become, um, you know, in, in one trade mission, they incorporated med tech, um, and then the other one was on female founders. Um, I think it would be great to, to see a way that, uh, the, the program targeted and the represented groups um, so that it, it is sort of um, available to everybody uh, in that regard. Okay, Kim. Thank you. Yes, it was definitely down to business eligibility. So UK registered company um, based in London, looking to grow across London, uh, I think looking at the turnover. Okay. Thank you. Were any of you asked if you knew anybody that you could introduce um, London and Partners to that would help other organisations? Yeah, we were. Um, I think generally they like us to to be advocates for the programme and to bring in, you know, founders who might not necessarily have the network to to get access to you know someone at LMP so yeah we, we are encouraged to talk about it and to bring and to refer you know kind of earlier stage businesses to the program but I mean from say if, if it was to America or Africa wherever but were you ever asked if you had contacts that you could bring that that, that could then be introduced so if you had any contacts abroad that LMP could take people to that would be helpful? Um, I was never asked explicitly about that, no. Chris? Not to no. my knowledge. Yeah. No, me neither. Can't recall. Okay, uh, Kim? No. Dr. Davis? No, I was never asked for that. Okay, because obviously there's a hole there because if we, if we can get people to introduce businesses to people they know abroad, that would be a a, a, a significant help for all of you but um, thank you for that the, the, my last question is how successful do you feel your involvement with London and Partners and the GLA has been um, some of you have touched on that already uh, both in terms of increasing your organisation's profile and in helping you to obtain new business opportunities so uh, shall I start this time with Kim Kim. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, very successful, I would say, from um, the earlier trade mission that took place to Australia. Uh, we're obviously now having conversations with the Department for Education, and that's been wonderful. We went on a recent trade mission, I say recent, it's probably been about two or three years, um, to Canada, and unfortunately, uh, we were very close doing a deal um, um, and having conversations with the uh, local government then. Fortunately, after 13 years of Labour government, it moved to a Conservative government and unfortunately there was a budget freeze. So I would say all in all quite successful. Okay, Dr Davis. I'm sorry, do you mind just repeating the question? I missed the question slightly, sorry. 
No problem. How successful do you feel your involvement with London and Partners and the GLA has been, both in terms of increasing your organisation's profile and in helping you to obtain new business opportunities? Um, I think in terms of uh, London and Partners and being on the female founder and a couple of the trade missions, it was really helpful for building profile and credibility. I think that uh, in reality, it was only uh, establishing Aparita in the US that was through, you know, partners uh, that we met through London and Partners on the Silicon Valley uh, program that, that we then made a, a success of winning new revenue as well. So there was definitely profile and credibility to start with. And then through the introductions, we managed to grow in client base as well. Lovely. Thank you. Chris? Hi. Sorry, do you mind if I just add a bit further to that? Just I've, I've made references to LMP, but I think it'd be useful just to mention the GLA in this. And actually, whilst they have helped both LMP and GLA to raise the profile, I think it would have been really useful had they have supported some of the events and international partners that we wish to embark on. Thank you. Chris? Um, it's been really useful for us. Um, it's given us some really good profile boosts in the early days as a, as a startup. It's great to have um, that kind of profile behind you to say you're, you're working with the mayor, uh, you're traveling internationally, you're considered to be one of the um, significant businesses in London that, that um, London's prepared to put time and effort and resource behind to promote. So that is really positive. We've had some great introductions, as I mentioned earlier, to a number of clients. Um, that has seen to um, some really great business relationships uh, and it, it's been really positive to what to what we've done and we've grown from uh, I, th I don't remember exactly how many we were at that time probably five or six people um, or thereabouts working on the project uh, there's now pretty much 55 60 of us that's really good news isn't it yeah we've, we've had a lot of investment and it's, and it's a lot all, of hard work uh, i imagine but uh, <laughs> we're very pleased thank you mainly from my team not me but um yes it, it it's been really useful. I would just, um, uh, on your point about introductions to other organisations, I think when you think of those um, young companies coming up, there's not really an opportunity to share your contacts with other people. I'm, I'm not sure you'd get a lot of benefit for the group through that, but um, I definitely think it's something that's worth looking at. It's an interesting idea. If somebody did have a lot of contacts, that would certainly be helpful, though. Um, and lastly, Melinda. I think um, so in terms of profile building it's been really instrumental in um, building you know a better platform the credibility of going on to um, the missions has been uh, really instrumental as well securing funding securing partnerships and ultimately you know growing my network and the contacts that I have globally which has definitely made a massive difference to the growth of my business and the expansion of the business as well I think when we first went on the mission, I think we had three people or four people. We're now 20. We have an office in New York. You know, we've hugely <laughs> changed our turnover and revenue, and we've got you know our sights set on uh, much bigger targets in the next few years as well. So, and I feel that um, you know, also as I mentioned, that peer network of you know getting those founders together. And, um, you know, you, you form quite special bonds and you share a lot on these missions. And for me, that's been really helpful as well, because I have some really key people that I can turn to, as I said earlier. Um, so that's another benefit that I've found. And then, yeah, I think just learning about the markets in the market is is just priceless. And I'd like to say something else. And, you know, this kind of program these programs don't happen in any other city that I know of and um, certainly there's you know coming from South Africa um, I would never have had these opportunities never in a million years would I've had these opportunities um, that LMP have put us in front of and I'm hugely grateful that they exist and they've been so helpful to the growth of my business well we love to hear of businesses doing well so good luck to all of you thank you chair thank you I've just got one final question that's occurred to me as we're having this discussion. Um, what is the cost to you, your business of going on these trade missions? What, what is covered? What do you have to pay for, either as an individual or through your company? Chris. Um, 
from memory, we pretty much paid for everything because if we were going on our own, I right. think w there was some assistance in um, in particular when we went to a, a German trade show and I think they covered the cost of the tickets uh, they did had some kind of arrangement um, locally for that which was in itself really helpful these tickets can be you know, anything from 200 pounds to 2,000 pounds of a trick ticket to a trade show so uh, other than that though I don't recall there being any anything really maybe a, a block booking negotiated room rate I think we had to pick up the tab for everything. Yeah, I mean, and from what I remember, we had to definitely get our own flights and transport. I think there were a couple of meals that were maybe sponsored by, especially in Silicon Valley, they were sponsored by all these big VCs who yeah. uh, had us in their offices for lunch and things like that. Um, and then I think there was, yeah, there was like a negotiated room rate that was much less than... But you pick up the bulk of it, there might be a little bit of hospitality when you're Yeah, there, a little bit you... of hospitality and I think in, in Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley trip, I think the bus, you know, was covered by one of the sponsors. Yeah. Um, so there was literally transport during the day, um, but yeah. that was it, I think. Thank you. And Kim and Dr Davies, was it the same for you? Yes, I think the flights um, were, and, and obviously transport was, was down to us to see individual businesses, but um, hotels were covered. Um, and, I, and, and again, the tickets were also covered depending on the, in, in the event itself. There was a limit on the number of trade missions from what I recall. Yes. So if, you've done, if you've done a couple, but, and, and actually then you've reached your limit, I think thereafter that you actually pay for the tickets or whatever else it might be, but you can certainly come along. Lovely, thank you. Unless I see any other members, I think that ends our questions in this first session. So can I um, thank our guests for this first part of the session? So Chris Scattergood, Melinda, Nikki, Dr Ellen Half-Davies and Kim Rehow for your contribution. It's given us a lot of food for thought and a bit of an insight into trade missions you've attended. So thank you very much indeed. You are now... Um, free to um, leave the meeting and we'll just uh, pause whilst we uh, get ready for our second uh, session. So uh, thank you very much indeed. No, thank you all. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, I think, shall I just adjourn for five minutes and make sure we've got our next guest on? Is that okay, members? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very sensible.
Welcome back to the GLA Oversight Committee. We've now reached our second panel today, um, looking at um, London and Partners and GLA governance issues. And I'm uh, delighted to welcome Jennifer Akuri, entrepreneur and founder of Hacker House and Innotech Network. So welcome, um, Jennifer. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, could I start off the questions, and I'm going to ask you, can you give us some background to your organisations and what they do? Thank you very much for having me. You know, Tech was started um, as an MBA student in 2012. We ran an event, and it actually didn't become a formal company until the following year. Uh, before the April 2013 event. And at the time, the Tech City uh, space in East London that was happening um, was very exciting. There was a lot of interest from abroad. And what my events did was they ultimately, ultimately became that vehicle for attracting uh, both policymakers, corporates, and then those startup innovative entrepreneurs that were ahead of the time in London's tech scene. And so that was the vein and cusp of the InnoTech from beginning, uh, building and launching businesses in uh, London. And we took off with my MBA and then continued forward for a few years. Now Hacker House actually came out of the birth of one of the events that I did at BAFTA, Tech versus uh, lifetime in jail, where we talked about cybersecurity, and it was the first time uh, in in London's history to have uh, law enforcement on stage with some of these young adolescent hackers. And we had a very open, controversial conversation about what it means or the gray area inside cybersecurity. And there was such an overwhelming interest in the space of cybersecurity and the development of cyber skills. Then actually that event inspired me at the top, that was at the end of 2014. Uh, the top of 2015, I went on a few more trade missions um, with you know, the Cyber Select uh, event in DC. I was going over to San Francisco. I was you know, basically searching the entire country in the United Kingdom, the best and the brightest of cyber talent. And I myself did five certifications that year in the space of cybersecurity, certified ethical hacking, certified penetration testing, you know, everything that the industry recognized for cyber skills. So by the end of 2015, I had realized Hacker House was somewhere between a cybersecurity company and a skills training development uh, thing, you know, somewhere between education and uh, software and consulting services. So this is where, you know, the, de the development of uh, the advent of Hacker House came from was the interest inspired from my events. Mm -hmm. And by 2016, you know, my events kind of uh, had dwindled while my cybersecurity interest had taken off. So that was obvious where I with my Lovely. Thank, thank you for that. And how did your organisations become involved with London and Partners and the GLA? That's a great question. So I was thinking about that in preparation for this. I believe my first London and Partners event happened when I was an MBA student. And my MBA halt was very international. And one of the students had invited me to this new programme uh, that London was launching to attract more international business. And I thought, well, this is a win-win, the most international MBA school with this new. And I, I remember meeting David Slater that first night um, when they were kind of launching what, you know, became London and Partners, uh, where he and I had immediate, um, you know, crossover or common ground because he had been in Los Angeles. We had, you know, started talking Los Angeles stuff. Probably, hey, you know, talk. he was asking me what I was doing here in London. I explained I was a student. You know, there was about six or seven other MBAs, you know, from my program also attending that event. And, you know, from day one, it, that first event in April, um, you know, London and Partners were present. And this was actually the first time that, you know, in that press conference with the mayor, 
Um, it was the first time he had mentioned London and Partners publicly or had spoken about technology. So it was a huge win for London and Partners to have captured the mayor, you know, in that very, very early and sipping in, you know, uh, tech city days. Um, so that's what I remember being memorable with London and Partners after that first InnoTech event in 2012. I mean, I had no idea that would happen. That was just one of the most organic timing, mm -hmm. you know, after he spoke, he happened to you know, speak on camera about London and Partners and the tech scene. So that was the beginning of that. The GLA, I didn't get introduced to or really know too much um, until the, I guess you would say the Malaysia trip, because I mean, while I had met people from the, you know, the GLA mayor's team, I, you know, I didn't really have much association with them. Okay. And just, just to clarify, so David, I didn't catch the surname, the person from London. Later. Okay. <laughs> from London and Partners. But last week we had London and Partners before us and they tried to suggest that they had virtually nothing to do with trade missions before 2016. Does that reflect your experience? Well, I think to the point that they're making, when London and Partners, at least in the days that I had met it, was very early on um, and where their funding was kind of, there was an initial bit of funding and then I remember they didn't know what, how they were going to branch off and, and kind of, you know, build a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's been you know, that 2016 pivot, they became more involved with trade missions. But at least from what I, you know, re remember, I had worked with one of them partners uh, from New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and London um, on all four cities. And they were all extremely active on, you know, being, you know, on the ground, finding, you know, entrepreneurs and companies and startups that could potentially move and make their home uh, in London. So there was a lot of crossover. And that's, that's how I, I remember, you know, they would, they were, you know, maybe there was a trade mission in, in New York, and then they were doing events there. Um, you know, in New York, particularly, there was a breakfast, and it was a rather large event. And they were, you know, there was a remit to find fintech companies, because that's what the trade mission was. So they were looking far and wide in New York for companies that were trading over two million that could, you know, move and set up in London. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, you know, just because of my contacts at Dumbo, you know, down Brooklyn Bridge, Bloomberg, you know, I had an extensive network through New York where I could put some feelers out for those fintech companies, which is ultimately why I was allowed to go to that one breakfast meeting uh, in New York. And I did bring some entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really remember the formalities. I just remember the company or the, the London and Partners being so amazingly granular and ready to do whatever it took to bring these companies into London. Um, that they would go to events. They, you know, they hosted events. Um, they were right there in the heart of the tech startup community. Yeah. So so. That technically they may not have organized the trade missions, but they were absolutely at the heart of them, um, bringing business together and so on, as you describe. It, yeah, as I remember, yeah. Fantastic. And how did you find out about the opportunities to receive sponsorship and also to participate in trade missions? Well, uh, I guess that begins with the first event, um, you know, InnoTech had done very well with our Google Hangout in April 2013. And, you know, later that summer, I had learned about an event, uh, the World Islamic Economic Forum. Now, London and Partners and I naturally built a very solid relationship because my events, specifically the one I had just held in April, was, you know, three events in one. We had three events at the same time, Los Angeles uh, and Bloomberg in San Francisco and London. So the, the amazing outreach that these events gave and the kind of invitation to London were already there. So London and partners saw firsthand my ability to get to the California um, coast. 
now I was, you know, now they had a remit to do a, an event within the event um, at the later part of 2013 with the World Islamic Economic Forum. And that's where they brought out, a, or they put out a tether um, to do an event for that. Somehow I had gotten word through, you know, this kind of, um, you know, through one of the events I had found out they were producing this. And I said, why don't we do a, an Innotech event? You know, the Hangout was so successful. And they thought that, you know, that would be great, submit a tender. So I did. And it, was, it came down to me and another gentleman, and I remember us going into London and Partners, pitching our idea. Now, London and Partners already saw the value of Innotech. So it was very easy for them to visualize what exactly I would do with the MENA region. And I did just that. Not only that, over the summer, there was an investor from the MENA region who was also British, who was very well networked and knew all of Number 10's advisors and was, you know, very connected within the London hemisphere. And he was, you know, speaking to London partners about launching a 100 million pound fund. And that would be matched with both the London government and this abroad MENA uh, region, you know, various key players, you know, uh, hedge funds and investors that were going to put this bridge fund together to fund both entrepreneurs coming from this Middle Eastern region uh, that wanted to set up in London and both London uh, entrepreneurs that wanted to go out there. So it was a two-way street. So I set up this entrepreneur hangout mm -hmm. with the World Islamic Economic Forum. And the budget that I put together was for 50,000 pounds. This included 10,000 pounds from London and Partners, whose remit Oh, dear. Wow, I'm being sick. I think we just lost you there. Should I reset it? Um, so Let's just try. Sorry. We just lost or you Did you hear me bit. or was it just I my can... frozen face? You want to come back on the screen? You're frozen. Whether you want to turn the camera off and then on again? Oh, vanished. I think you vanished off the screen. Do you want to come put the camera back on? No, vanished off the call. I can see everyone on the call, of Caroline. You I can. don't know if you Thank can you. see it. Thank yeah. You. So um, remember, so maybe I think Jennifer was just saying that she might come off and re-enter the call. Yeah. Okay. Let's right. just wait a moment. Yeah, I had to do that earlier. We're on the World Islamic Forum. Just she was discussing. So keep that in our minds. Yeah. No, I'm coming to you in a second, assembly and, fortune. And uh, she's just coming back in. I can just see a square. I can probably see more of because I've you got can. my screen up, so I can probably see more. Then you can. Jennifer is back on. I can't Are see her back, face. Jennifer? But she... Hey, she, I can see her face again. We're back, okay. we're back again. We lost you there. Sorry, Jennifer, we lost you. Um, do you want to just, you were just talking about you'd secured this 50,000 funding for this event at the um, World Islamic Forum, I think it was. Sure. Um, the event was to take place bringing together various hangouts that discussed uh, the topics within the tech ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, London and Partners wanted to have their own kind of panel discussion and you know make sure that they had the plug in there. Uh, uh, Taylor and Wessig were also a part of it. Ernst and Young were also a part of it. We had sponsorship from the Sirius program who were also looking to recruit entrepreneurs. You, so you see I tied everybody inside the current London ecosystem that were venturing out outside of London and looking to recruit that talent and those entrepreneurs uh, to the area. And those ultimately were who provided the initial funding. Now this fund was a big part of this event. Mm. Now for anyone who thinks it's just, you know, conspiracy, that is not true. Mm -hmm. It was such a big deal for London and Partners. They set up meetings for us at London and Partners where me and my business partner and a few others and a, you know, there there was about six or seven of us at the time who were meeting to talk about how to implement uh, this 100 million pound fund. By Christmas, you know, of that year, the fund had kind of fallen apart. You know, it kind of became a political thing between David Cameron and Boris Johnson. I remember 
stuff like that happening yeah. that was beyond me. I didn't never asked Boris Johnson to come to that event. The mayor was that was not my invitation. Um, the invitation was he was going to come to that event and he was going to launch this hundred million pound fund, which is why that video was was shot. And then the funding or the the sponsorship that I received paid for everything else. It paid for the food, the cake, the tons of uh, the film. I mean, it was like a film set that day because we had, you know, a huge live streaming equipment. We had a film equipment, uh, film crew of of our own that were also going to be editing all the videos. You know, it was basically just producing any other London event expensive. Uh, the and it you know it did well. Like people loved yes. that event, um, and the videos are still on stage. And the production and the high quality of it really rang out to the MENA region so much so that I learned so much about entrepreneurship and I met you know some brilliant authors and some brilliant data scientists that were coming over so I mean to say that event was anything less than a success is false Absolutely. because London and partners got what they wanted um, with that event just, just so that's how go ahead I was gonna say, just to be very um, short on this so London and partners once you were aware of them you were working very closely with them with a series of events um, that you have started to describe some of them um, and so they would let you know when opportunities were coming up and you would bid to them as well. Of course. So it was, of a, course. It was a, so you had to, there was somebody that I knew that they wanted to get to, you know, they, it was a two way, yeah. you know, because like I said, we were very active in the community and that was a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to our colleague, assembly member fortune. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, to, or good morning, I suppose, isn't it, where you are, uh, to, to Ms. Khoury. Um, what's been really interesting preparing for this meeting is looking at the, the businesses that our guests have founded, both the, the, the previous guests that we had on before you and, and your own as well. So I've had a look at Innotech. I've got the Hacker House uh, website open in front of me. It's, it's, you know, it's providing some really good and positive impact for, for London businesses. What has struck me, though, uh, listening to our guests is how people have found out about the opportunities that London and Partners uh, offers. A lot of it sounds like word of mouth or you know somebody just bumped into somebody. It's interesting listening to you. You were progressing through your master's degree and you spoke with somebody and that sort of opened the door. So how do you think that London and Partners can be better, and the GLA as well, I suppose? How can we all be better at promoting these opportunities and making sure that we get other great businesses engaged? Well, at the time, I mean, <laughs> for me to speak about where they are right now is a different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, at the time, you know, you have to remember London Tech City, like, you know, the drinking every Friday night. Where was it? Who knows? You found out at five o'clock. You know, you would you would look out and you see what's on the roster for events this week. You know, London and Partners was most definitely there. I was most definitely there. Um, this was the great thing. I mean, in many ways, they were very much like a startup in that, you know, we were pulling together something that didn't exist, which was a tech ecosystem. Um, where they could do better now, I mean, that's not really my place to say because I haven't been there um, to comment. But I remember at the time them being extremely hands-on and making any connections they could do, breakfast meetings, you know, sponsorship, long bike rides, if it meant giving to charity, just to be front and center um, in the heart of the tech community, whatever they needed. You know, this is what we and we would come back to them. Look, we need more access to cash. We need more access to visas, you know, entrepreneurship visas. We need, you know, a, an entrepreneur uh, accelerator program that does X, Y, Z. And one of the partners was there for all of that. Now, does a tech ecosystem stay the same forever? No. Like most things, it changes and evolves. So naturally, those needs change. And as those companies, I remember towards the end of my time uh, with tech, you know, the, the big discussion went from focus on startups to how do we scale up? You know, and this is where you saw the broader tech ecosystem, things, you know, amazing initiatives like Tech London Advocates and, you know, um, all the different, you know, various uh, groups inside there talking about scaling these companies. Okay, we did it, London. 
we launched a tech ecosystem. Now, how do we build unicorn after unicorn and give these growth and job? And so that's where I think, you know, ultimately London Partners did what most companies had to do and pivot to where their long term uh, vision would echo and adapt to those overall, you know, changing needs within the tech sector. So would you say at the time, um, it sounds like it was quite an exciting time and it was, it was electric, it was, I'll never forgive myself for using this word, but organic. It was, it was growing and it was sort of uh, reaching out and encouraging people in. So there was a big open front door to get people into London and Partners to become part of that family, to grow the, um, the exciting London tech centre. Is that, is that a fair representation? Oh, 100%. And, you know, when I got my flat in Shoreditch, I mean, we, I turned it into a tech hotel. There were that many people calling me up from San Francisco and everywhere else, Canada. I mean, you name it. Jennifer, tell, tell us, where do we go in London? What's Google Campus? Where's Central yeah. Working? Show I, me what's Silicon Roundabout. What's the bro yeah. thing? You know, there was just so much going on. And that's what was really, I mean, if you weren't part of it, then... That's yeah. unfortunate because those of us that were remember the excitement and living for those events and, yeah. you know, looking at how the changing landscape of London, you know, first, you know, being hesitant and what, the, what is this texting and then all of a sudden adapting it and then all of a sudden going on trade missions around the world, showing the world, this is London and we're proud of it. And we happen to be really good okay, at FinTech, yeah. EdTech. And, so you know, so I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say, and nobody here will be surprised that I wasn't invited to any of those parties and, and still <laughs> am. Um, but so let's, let's talk about getting to that front door. So there's all this exciting stuff going on. And then, and then we get into the, I call it a sausage machine last week when we were talking talking to people from, from London and Partners, which is about what's the application process? This is where it sort of becomes the more boring bit, I suppose. But can you, can you tell us a little bit about what was the, the application process you went through, both for the sponsorship and for, for any of the um, uh, delegations as well? So really quickly then for the sponsorship, because I've already kind of explained yeah. the value add that I gave to London and Partners for the World Islamic Economic Forum. I mean, obviously, I didn't have the 100 billion million whatever pounds to put into this fund. That wasn't what I was there for. I was there to make sure the tech startup community was front and center of this fund. Um, so that's why in that remit of those events and my hangouts, and you guys can Google it on YouTube. The videos are still there. You know, if I was producing closet basement, creepy crawler events, I'd get it. But if you look at the caliber of people who were speaking and the views, you know, and, and the venues of which I was producing these events, people wanted to be a part of them. It was a no brainer. So that was the World Islamic Economic Forum. Um, flash forward a year, the serious program had launched. I was, you know, I did my part. I was very successful in help bringing them a pipeline of students, but they also, to their credit, stood on their own. And the people behind the serious program are amazing, and I, I applaud them to this day for working as hard as they did to bring in such foreign talent. And they had people from Israel, I mean, all over. It was amazing. South America. So I immediately... When I came back in London with my visa, I was ready to start producing events. So I launched the serious pro. I did a event at level 39. Again, very successful. Then I was also doing an event with one of the conservative MPs who gave me the privilege of allowing me to do an event on the terrace at Parliament. And I worked hand in hand with one of my speakers who had done a short film for BBC Newsnight um, around the eradication of tech jobs or eradication of middle, uh, middle class jobs to tech. And so we had this whole concept of singularity and how the middle class were going to evolve and change. So naturally, Parliament and other uh, MPs were very interested in this topic. And because I just came off, you know, back from California, I had a lot of good friends that were coming over. So there was a lot of interest. I had a media company that was very involved in that event. So producing an event at Parliament was also quite an attractive, uh, you know, opposite or proposition. So one of the partners came back to me and said, look, you know, we don't, we can't really do much this time, but you know, we can give you 1500 pounds. And I thought, great, you're buying a, you're buying my guests a cup of coffee. Thank you. I mean, because this event was very expensive. Um, but the video content we took stood, you know, stands the test of time. You can look at it on YouTube. It was an extremely well-polished, very chic event. It's one of the best I did. And London and Partners loved every bit of it. I mean, because of the caliber of people who attended, um, it was short to the point. 
parties. You know, we got in, we got out. And so that was my sponsorship uh, to, for my both events. Now, Malaysia trip was the first application I did for a trade mission. I was very keen because quite honestly, I was working so hard to stay in London. The last thing I really wanted to do was leave London ever. Um, but I had a lot of interest from China and the Middle East. And one of the things that they were, you know, interested in was this uh, algorithm I had produced called Playbox. Now, naturally, I, you know, look, look, this was uh, the fall, so September ish of 2014 for the Malaysia trip. And I had done a few events. Naturally, my events had generated a lot of content. Some of my yeah. content was about an hour and a half long. If I could, sorry, um, just, just, just to interrupt, because, because I'll, I'll, I'll go into other people's time, which is why I don't get invited okay. to parties, frankly. So skipping back to what you said about your, the first application to, to Malaysia, there was, a, there was a process you went through to, to apply for the, for the trip. And with the sponsorship, there was, um, there was a sort of a history of high value work that London and Partners had been aware of. Is that, is that correct? Yes, but I mean, make no mistake, I had to produce uh, marketing material like like a like a marketing kit at the end. And I had to go meet their marketing lady. I mean, but I had no qualm with I mean, I was at London Partners almost every other day. So it didn't bother me in the slightest to have to do what they requested, you know, to come back to to more London to see okay, them. Then. So it wasn't. I mean, but I, I mean, I did have to stick to the stick protocol under no circumstance. Was it like, oh, Jennifer, you're in. Yeah. Um, David Slater made very clear that all marketing stuff had to be, you know, going through the channels, which they did. And so both times that I received money, I was responsible not only to present the value add to the organization, but to follow up with a PDF of what InnoTech did, you know, in the videos and the links. But keep in mind, you can still look at them on YouTube. They have generated a lot of views and traffic. So London and Partners wasn't sitting there, you know, nitpicking what exactly their sponsorship went to, they so went just, to the events. Just, they sorry, just the, just the final point for me, because you know, I've, got, I've got to give other people some time. So you mentioned Dave Slater there. Was, he was your contact at London Partners, is that right? Or did you have any other contacts? Who would you mostly speak with about uh, projects? I mean, I, I think it's fair to say I don't want to put David in the spot because he was incredible at that time. I mean, that's the only reason I've mentioned him, but there's a lot of many wonderful people at London and Partners. I mean, I was extremely close to many of them. I mean, I was, a, I knew, I knew Gordon. I knew him, um, you know, from the events that I, Gordon Ennis. I knew very well. I knew, you know, Sarah French later came over there. I knew Janet Coyle. I knew, I mean, I mean, I, I, I knew most of everybody from marketing to, you know, for the various regions, I would speak to them because obviously my events were global. So, you know, obviously the person that was in charge of North America and Canada wanted to meet with me and, you know, I could go back through my emails, but I'd recognize faces than to kind of, you know, split off enough, you know, all the names. And I don't mention these people because I fault them in any way. I mention them because they, the work they did at that time yeah. was incredibly valuable for London Partners. Thank you very much for your time. It's time for me to hand back over, but I appreciate your okay. answering the questions. I just wanted to do some follow-ups. Could you tell us who you actually dealt with in the mayor's office? Um, so initially, I mean, it, it kind of depended on the events. Uh, over time, I got to know And then in the World Islamic Economic Forum, I was dealing with okay. and Eddie Lister was also just speaking to David Slater and, and the team behind, you know, there was that kind of discussion. Um, I did go meet Mopac at City Hall. So there were various people and a few other people of the Bears team who I, their names escape me at the moment. but. I, I knew various people um, for the various, you know, points that I needed for my events. Okay. Um, I think some of the released emails we've seen from 2013 said that you show that you were told by an official in the mayor's office to refrain from going via the mayor direct, as you didn't always have sight of his diary. Um, 
and you received permission, I think, to attend the New York Trade Mission in an unofficial capacity from a mayoral advisor. Who was it in the mayor's office that advised you that you could attend in an unofficial capacity? No one. I mean, that's completely false. The truth is I was already in New York and I wasn't, I wasn't part of the trade mission. I wanted to go to some events uh, with my London friends while they were in New York. So I said, what do you need? And you know, at the time they wanted FinTech folk that were moving to London. And so I was on the hand, you know, hands on the ground trying to find between WeWork and Dumbo and you know, everywhere within New York. Uh, who would fit that category. And as a result, I was invited to the breakfast event. And who were you, um, who were you so invited, I was invited by? To the American British breakfast or that event, the, the uh, evening event. But that also is because I knew these guys from my Intec events. Yeah. No, Never I because I, I needed from to go to I understand that, Ms. Akuri. I understand that. But it's clear from the emails we have seen that were part of um, the report from IOPC and others that um, a mayoral advisor gave permission for you to attend these events at that trade mission and I'm just wondering who it was in the mayor's office who gave you that permission. Well permission I did not need but if you're looking for the person with whom it was probably told that I was going to be there. Yes. Uh, that person would be Will Walden. Will Walden. So that was the, mayor, the former mayor's director of communications. That's um, very helpful. And um, I'll, I'll come back in with some other questions in a minute. Let me move on and bring in some colleagues. So I've got um, next Assembly Member Armoured. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, Mr. Curry. Thank you so much for attending. I understand that you've had to work around the school run to be here, so I appreciate that. I know what that's like. <laughs> Um, so, what, if any, relationships did anyone from your organisation have with the Mayor of London or GLA officers at the time of securing a place on the Mayor's International Business Programme? Say that again, please. Sure. So, what, if any, relationships did anyone from your organisation have with the Mayor of London or GLA officers at the time of securing a place on the Mayor's International Business Programme? I'm not sure I ever was. I mean, I went on the one trade mission to Malaysia, but that's because I was building a piece of video tech that China wanted, and it was a win-win for me to go on that mission. Um, but I'm not sure anybody else in my organization had anything to do with the mayor's team. So, so did, did any, was there any kind of relationship is, is what I asked. I don't know if you heard that. I think oh, something's going wrong with the link at the moment. No, I'm sorry. I didn't, no, there's no relationship. Thank you. Um, I've got some specific questions to ask uh, about events. So how did you come to be involved in launching the £100 million Middle East Tech Fund at the World Islamic Economic Forum in 2013 in London, alongside with the former mayor, Boris Johnson, London and Partners, UKTI and Quantum Capital Partners? I was thinking about that as well. <laughs> Where did that start? And I think it started under the remit that they weren't sure where they were going to launch the fund. Uh, they didn't know if they were going to do it on the main stage at the Excel Center. They didn't know if it was going to be Daniel Porsky or David Cameron or Boris Johnson. So the fact that it worked for them to find a venue or off the main stage at Excel so that Boris could come in and out and we could also have the other speakers and then have the space. That was mainly the thing for all the, the live stream equipment. Um, I remember in the end, that's kind of how they said, all right, we're gonna have Boris announce it and he's gonna do it at your event. 
So I didn't actually, and then I, I remember, you know, um, uh, thinking, okay, well then we got to coordinate around his people, you know, everybody else that's speaking, but that was not my invitation for that event. And, and somehow in this process of producing this event within the event for the world Islamic economic forum, um, this fun, you know, I had met the investor and he was very keen and loved the work I did um, as a as a way to um, attract some of the best and the brightest talent, which we did. I mean, we met some great, amazing companies in that time that had we actually launched that fund would have done tremendously well with that investment. Thank you. So as a successful founder of a tech company, you, you were a member of the exclusive International Conclave of Entrepreneurs, or ICE for short. How did you or IC approach the GLA for the funding they provided through the Mayor's Export Programme, alongside the support given by UKTI for the South Africa Trade Mission in November 2013? There is no merit to that stuff. I'm not very sure that how true any of that is to begin with, and anything that would be true I was not privy to. I became a member of ICE because of, you know, the amazing people that make it, you know, make up of it. And I was obviously very keen to do events globally and launch tech cities, you know, everywhere with my Inotech. So, you know, the invite to, to South Africa had nothing to do with the GLA, you know. Um, I know that there were some talks between possible remits of promoting the entrepreneurs, but I'm not sure there was ever, you know, as far as I was concerned, there was never any, um, uh, I don't know, discussion of that. I mean, I, I wasn't privy to anything like that. Thank you. And uh, the International Conclave of Entrepreneurs Trip to South Africa in November 2013, which is part funded by the GLA and uh, UKTI was unique amongst the trade missions supported by the Mayor's Export Programme. In that, ICE, rather than the GLA, selected the delegates. Did you have to apply to go on this visit, or were you one of the organisers, and did you also have to provide feedback to the GLA on the outcomes of the visit? I mean, like I said, I had no knowledge of um, the GLA's involvement with that trip. I was invited on merely a social context of being part of ICE, you know, and, and the fact that we were able to take 10 days and go to three different cities and the work that we did. I mean, that was an amazing life-changing trip. So I thought I was going again, to speak to people in different cities to launch my events. I, I had no knowledge of the GLA, anything. And I don't remember ever filling out. But I mean, there might have been something that doesn't mean that I filled it out. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, for me, what did you set out to achieve from attending a London and Partners trade mission? Well, I never actually attended a trade mission in a formal capacity. My relationship with London and Partners built, um, you know, through um, and amongst the organization through the friendships and the business relationships I had built with them, you know, again, through the remit of my videos and my physical in-person events. So, you know, for example, if you're going down the Tel Aviv route, I mean, I was already going to Tel Aviv. There was meant to be another trade mission with Matt Hancock that didn't time, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't able, he was going to take cybersecurity companies. Um, and I didn't know when exactly that was going to be. Um, and this trade mission was actually for education companies. And my interest was somewhere in between cybersecurity and, and, and the development of uh, the pipeline of cyber skills. So I was already in the discussions with Venture 8 and certain you know, key players within the cybersecurity remit when I learned about the trip uh, with London and Partners and, or that trade mission that was going over there for the education companies, in which I just 
um, happened to mention, well, I'm going to be in Tel Aviv. And then I, you know, found out where they were staying and the guy, you know, that does the uh, travel planning for London and Partners also said, hey, I heard you're also in Tel Aviv. Do you want me to book you a room? You know, this person flies in at this time. When are you flying in? The same time. Great. You know, so we booked, I booked off, you know, I was giving basically my business to the same person that London and Partners uses. But I wasn't there in any real capacity um, in Tel Aviv. I was invited to certain events, but I had my own schedule. Um, and again, London and Partners needed female venture capitalists. They needed to be introduced to a few, and I had a few to introduce them to. One of them happened to go on the event with me, and she stayed with me most of the time in the hotel, except when I left to go off site to do the meetings I had to do. We went to one or two events with a trade mission, but for the most part, we weren't, uh, we weren't really involved. We just saw them at the hotel. Thank you very much. That's my questions finished. Thank you, Chair. Just pick up, you just said, so when you went to Tel Aviv, you had someone from London and Partners with you who stayed with you most of the time. Is that what you said? She wasn't a London and Partners. She was a venture capitalist. Right. And London and Partners had an event and certain venture capital. I mean, I'm not actually sure what she did certain things with London and Partners. I had no, I was not a part of at all. Um, because private. they needed, they wanted more female, uh, you know, to kind of represent London. Lovely, thank you. Um, I've got Assemblymember Sohota, you wanted to come in here? Yes, I, thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us from Florida. Uh, I just want to uh, be absolutely clear in my mind that you didn't go on a trade mission to Tel Aviv. No. Okay. Uh, the, the, some papers from the London Party show that you flew two days early with, a, with, a, with an official of London Partners. Is, is that true? Yeah, that's the story I just told you of using their same travel guy. Um, and I booked it to just fly over with Sarah, um, you know, to be in the hotel. But there were, there were very specific meetings I was doing and that, you know, I was, you know, in my own right, that I, you know, wasn't actually asking permission to go to Tel Aviv. I was going. Um, there were a lot of introductions that I had already made in the, again, cybersecurity space. Um, you know, my, my exact words were, you know, you don't go sell ice to Eskimos. I mean, so I need something else other than cybersecurity to bring to uh, Israel. So I had a direct remit of a cyber skills capacity, much in line with Unit 8200 and their military, you know, program they set up, and then Venture 8, which basically picks out entrepreneurs from the, mil you know, the cyber force. And at the time, I was uh, discovering how Hacker House could basically uh, surfeit that need in the UK, you know, for the development of those cyber skills. And, and did the mayor's office or the London Partners Office help you in any way on that trip? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I was invited to the High Commissioner event. And, and your hotel costs were pay, being paid by yourself or by, by the LMP? Uh, yes, sir, I paid them. You and paid I your... paid my food. Okay, great. Thank you much for that. Lovely. Yes, Senator McCartney. Can I just ask you, Mr. Curie, did LMP book your hotel room for you even though you paid it yourself? No, ma'am. Um, they have an independent guy who has his own business that he does. Um, he's very hands-on, and he works with a lot of the entrepreneurs that he'll, you know, do their their travel in addition to London and Partners. So it wasn't, you know, outside the scope of I'm just going to use the same guy uh, that they do because I had I had known I've you know got to know him i've met him at events he used you know he gave me his card whenever you're traveling abroad let me do your travel and that's what i did okay thank you um just if i could just pick up from the last set of questions you said that um there was no relationship with anyone from your organization with the mayor of london or gla officers um but you, you've made clear publicly in the press that you had a close relationship with the former mayor 
What is the Mayor's Office aware of this relationship and who in the Mayor's Office? I believe this, first of all, this interrogation is about my involvement. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't necessarily want to go into answering personal details, but I will say that it was not so much that people knew about my secrets any more than I knew of theirs. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of, I mean, I can name at least three high profile things that, you know, and so people knew that there was an interest uh, of the mayor in, in me, um, yes. that he had somewhat of a crush on me when we went to events. You know, everyone could see the dramatic difference of this man when I entered the room. So there was not ever a time where I feel, I, I mean, I had to say anything. People mm -hmm. kind of assumed what they wanted, um, but there was never any discussion about any of it. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not trying to get into the personal side at all. What I'm trying to understand is in terms of governance and process and due diligence, were people in the mayor's office clearly aware of this relationship and therefore in terms of access to trips and so on, you know, whether they should have declared anything. And so I was wondering who in the mayor's office probably knew. Yes, but understand, I mean, whether or not they assumed whatever they wanted, it didn't change the fact that really Jennifer R. Curie was, you know, the most annoying, perseverant, you know, hustler that like, even when they said no, I didn't listen. I, I assumed yes, just find another way to say yes to me. I mean, those are my words. I would invite them and then relentlessly. So, you know, my relationship with, with the mayor or non-relationship had really no bearing in my complete pursuit of London and my ability to build a business. I had to fight like hell to get my visa to stay there. And so people knew that I was quite aggressive in my approach of not only selling my events and making sure the house was packed, but also networking, you know, within all the events readily available through the connections I could have. And yeah, they would roll their eyes. There's Jennifer again, good luck saying no to her. Mm. So that was more of the tone um, then sitting there going, he, he, let's talk about yes. the private life. Because like I said, there was plenty of that going on between them that really they didn't have a finger to point at. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I'll leave that there. Um, Assemblymember Polanski. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon or morning uh, as you are. Um, I wanted to ask you questions about engagement and communication uh, on the trade missions, but you've alluded that you were never there formally. Can I just clarify, did you ever formally go on a trade mission? Formally, I was officially on the Malaysia trade mission. Okay, and on the Malaysia trade mission, how was the engagement and communication both with the GLA um, and LMP, uh, both before, during and after? Just to be clear, I was also formally on other trade missions that never got mentioned in the press, but for the purposes of right now, I'll just say right now, I was only on the Malaysia trip. So can you please repeat your question? Yeah, absolutely. Although, could I ask which other ones you're on to that weren't in the press? So I went on a cyber select mission uh, to Washington, D.C. I was also part of the trade mission to San Francisco. I went on another um, event at the NSA symposium under the sign when they had the cyber envoy. I mean, again, I wouldn't take no for an answer. I would just go and then show up and then find my London friends because that's what it takes to build a business. And when you're hustling nothing, something from nothing, especially with the uh, clock ticking with me getting a visa, I had to be everywhere, find everyone interested in London because ultimately that helped my events and it helped build the ecosystem of which I was trying to promote. Absolutely, your persistence is really coming through. Um, so could I ask with those trade missions, all the ones that you went on, what was the engagement and communication like uh, both with uh, London and Partners, but also the GLA. Those weren't, the ones I just mentioned, were not part of the GLA or London and Partners. Understood. The ones that I did do with, you know, Malaysia, I found them to be overwhelmingly pleasant. I mean, the first time I went in for my interview with Sarah French, who I had never met, 
I uh, was very nervous, but they were lovely to me. They knew my events. They knew what I was trying to accomplish. They could see value in what I was building. Um, so there was never a question of me or why I was there. No one ever made me feel that way. That makes sense. And also with that, you mentioned initially you went to a party with a Conservative MP uh, who uh, put on an event at Parliament. Could I ask who the Conservative MP was? Well, which time? Pick your MP. Oh, I mean the very first Pick time. <laughs> um, well, the very first time or the, the time in which we're talking about for the Tech versus Brains event? Uh, the latter. Okay, so Tech versus Brains started the following fall, or the, the fall before. Um, I was working with a very, ama like an amazing um, government affairs company who was introducing me to politicians across the board. And one of the MPs who I met, I mean, he and I kicked it off with Tech. I mean, this guy was so switched on. Uh, his name is George Freeman. And he's a conservative MP who, you know, said, let's do an event together. Let's have these conversations. You talk about exciting and infectious. It was very cool to have such uh, buy-in and interest from all the parties now, because before that I had only, you know, started meeting them through party conference or different events that I had, was attending. I mean, digital labor was really off the chart too. So I met some fantastic people there. But just so happened, George Freeman said, um, I don't have time to go anywhere, but if you throw an event uh, at, at Parliament, I will come and speak. Mm. So that's what we did. We threw the event on the terrace because naturally that had the best view. Um, and he was one of our speakers for the panel. And we talked about the eradication of middle class jobs with the implementation of technology and what we choose and how we choose to implement that. Um, you know, legally from the corporate side and the startup side. It's fantastic. You should watch it on YouTube. Thank you. And then just a final question. You've talked quite a lot about London and partners, and you said you didn't have a lot of formal contact with the GLA. Um, was there any kind of engagement or communication after these trade missions formally with the GLA? I mean, sure. I was able to, I was starting to meet more and more people. You do see the same faces at a lot of the events, you know, the same kind of entourage that goes to the events in London will find their way on, you know, events abroad because that's how entrepreneurs work. I wasn't the only one. I heard one of your webinars where you said I was like the 16th person involved. Oh, please. There were several people that would come and go throughout the trade missions. That's just what it was. And if you were in London, when London happened to be in New York, well, find a, you know, find a point of the schedule where you could be a part of it because it just makes the networking experience far more uh, greater. So yes, there were certain people from the GLA. I remember Mopac being very interested in uh, finding a way to work with children in cybersecurity or some of the university boys that would otherwise get in big bad trouble. So I was meeting more and more people in the veins of the businesses that I was running. So it wasn't unheard of for me to have, you know, more, um, you know, I, I got to meet more people on trade missions. So naturally, yes, I was engaging more. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Just in terms of, um, met, you said the Mayor's Office of Police and Crime, were you dealing with officers there or were you dealing with the Deputy Mayor for Police and Crime at that time? I was dealing with a, I believe she's a Scottish woman named, okay, so I can look her up. An officer, so she, it's an officer within MOPAC. Did that progress at all, that piece of work? Uh, no, it did not. We, okay. I, I think merely because she took on a different, she pivoted in what she was doing and I kind of continued on with running these um, workshop kind of events for younger people, for young people entering industry. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Assemblyman McCartney, did you want to come in here? Yes, if I, if I can. Um, can I just confirm, Mr. Kira, that the only trade mission organised by London and Partners that you were officially part of was the Far Eastern trade mission, is that correct? To, well, I, I mean, the, the mission I remember being a formal delegate on was yeah. the one to Malaysia, Malaysia. Singapore, Kuala okay. Lumpur, that one. Okay. Thank you. And can I ask, did you have to submit a formal application for that? We, we've heard that 
since um, 2016, there is quite a rigorous formal application. I'm just trying to understand what was the process back then to become a formal delegate. Sure. Um, no, no doubt they've now built out their program impeccably because at the time, um, you know, they were building it <laughs> with each mission, right? So the first step for me was to go in and meet the two people running it and explain to them what value do I add? How, how, you know, what is my business? How would I um, interoperate with the people and the companies? And it just so happened Astra was one of the main company I was already in discussion with, and that was already on their agenda of companies to see. So I thought, oh, wow, this is cool. So, you know, that was the first initial discussion. I did have to fill out a form. There was a formal process, you know, of what you were planning to do abroad. And I honestly, I had never done anything like this before. So I just thought, you know, if they don't take me, oh, well, if they do, great, because now I can have a final, you know, reason to go to that part of the world. Um, which, like I said, I didn't really want to go anywhere but stay in London. <laughs> I just, you know, knew that there was appetite with this company that would tie into BBC Labs with the woman I was working with there who used to run it at the time. Her name was Hannah Blake. So if I could have married the two with that trade mission, Playbox would have been, you know, part of that accelerator and it would have been a different story. BBC shut down the labs, which ultimately collapsed the deal that I built from Malaysia. Thank you. You've previously said that the mayor's office threw obstacles in the way of you attending trade missions um, and that you expressed doubts about going on the Far East trade mission, but then the mayor's office um, stepped in and encouraged you um, to go. And, and I wondered um, why there was all the confusion and what was it that put you off? And um, perhaps who was it in the mayor's office that ultimately persuaded you that you should be going on this? Is this in terms of the, tele uh, the Malaysia trip? Yeah. Yes. So I remember maybe the day before the Malaysia trip, there was some talk of journalists seating a story at City Hall, um, you know, where that there was going to be some kind of revelation of a relationship. And I went to and I told him, this is what I'm hearing. I will happily back out because I am very ashamed that this would, if this is in any way, creating a dark, loomy cloud over this trade mission because this is the first time I've done anything like this. And the last thing I want to do is create any kind of, you know, any kind of dismal doubt on London. Like, I, you know, I'm happy. He said, no, Jen, don't worry about it. These things happen all the time. It's how about, he was like, is it, you know, is it going to run? And I was like, I don't know. We'll see. And, and so by the time we got to the high commissioner's house in Singapore, I remember Gordon S was standing over by uh, Will Walden. And I came over and I asked specifically, um, is this story going to run? Because I, I'm happily, I'm happy to leave this uh, event if there's going to be press here. And he said, don't worry about it. We're, you know, this is not going to be something that you need to worry about. Just focus on your business. And I said, great. Okay, thank you. And it was understood. Um, I remember joking with Gordon because I wanted to be part of their fancy digital, you know, panel and event, you know, and, and be one of their speakers. And he remember, I remember him saying, grow me a multi-million dollar or million pound company, Jennifer, and you soon will be up there. But, you know, welcome to the trade mission. So that was the spirit, you know, in which I was there. Everybody, you know, was very warm and welcoming. Never once did I feel any kind of shame stay in your dark corner. Mm. And naturally, when, you know, the mayor, the former mayor did show up at the event, I stayed back. I mean, there were many times they wanted to do events, uh, pictures, and I, you know, specifically stayed out of those pictures. I didn't want to draw attention to this. This is not why I was here. I didn't ask his permission. No one, you know, this was not something I was here to uh, make a scene of by any means. I had my own agenda and objective to fulfill. Thank you. Um, I think you have confirmed that you had a close friendship with the mayor. And I'm just wondering, because we're trying to work out that in the future, how we can learn lessons. 
Um, can I ask, did you give your opinions or share ideas with the Mayor, either before or after the trade missions, as to how they could be improved? I am definitely one to give my opinions, and I gave my opinions on many things. Things like the trade missions were not on my agenda of, of issues to discuss. He would oftentimes, you know, ask, how, how was the trade mission? Was it beneficial for you? And I would say, yes, all is well. And the, that would be the end of it. There would never be any kind of, um, you know, discussion beyond that. I would never go into details. I mean, if anything, all I did was sang praises of how these trade missions were set up and the amazing opportunities they were creating for the entrepreneurs of London. And he was well aware of that. Even if he done, didn't understand what exactly about this was, you know, gaining buy-in or interest. I mean, he, he wasn't really a fan of technology at that time. So it wasn't, you know, I was more, you know, do you have a private VPN? Have you set up two-factor authentication? Don't connect to free Wi-Fi. Has anyone trained you on any of this? I mean, those were my discussions on trade missions, just to make, you know, um, but we never discussed the people or the events, never. Okay, so Again, I had my own agenda. Thank you. Can I ask, did you tell him you were going on the trade missions before you went? Yes, there were um, two times before uh, Malaysia, we didn't really get to speak because it, you know, the, the story broke and then we were on these overnight crazy flights. And by the time there was any discussion, it was over there um, on the other side of the world. With uh, New York, I remember calling him specifically saying, look, you can fake it everywhere else. Maybe try it at one over in Los Angeles, but they'll eat you alive in New York. You cannot fake this. You got to stand in your, <laughs> stand resilient in technology and FinTech. Do you even know what FinTech is? And we had a discussion around you know, financial technology. So that, and blockchain and, you know, encryption and the importance. So that was the New York discussion. The other discussion was before Tel Aviv, where I made sure to give him a mouthful about never connecting to uh, public Wi-Fi. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That sounds very helpful. Um, can I ask, I think you've, you've got into this a little bit, but um, you've talked about the benefits that you brought to LNP. On those trade missions, were you able to actually bring in your own contacts to help the missions themselves? 100%, yes. There were people in Malaysia that my event from the World Islamic Economic Forum, um, I can't, there were investors from Kuala Lumpur, there were people in part of the government agency that was giving money to entrepreneurs in Singapore, I forget what that's called, but there were certain people that I had met, you know, through my World Islamic Economic Forum hangouts and, you know, had watched my content and were very excited to connect with the InnoTech network. In fact, there were people, you know, over there that wanted to have an event. So <laughs> I got to say, look, do you, who do you need when I, when we were in New York, um, <clears throat> at the time, I know London and Partners was interested in finding the co-working spaces and kind of permeating those sectors, those like hives of entrepreneurs. So it was very resourceful, you know, for Dumbo and WeWork and all the different kind of, you know, accelerators that were local in New York to show up for that FinTech breakfast. Because again, we were doing Ariana Huffington, Boris Johnson and uh, Joanna Shields. What a lineup, right? So we were very proud of London. And then underneath that event, there was a very extensive discussion about all the amazing opportunities that London had for the financial services. So the remit worked where I was able to helpfully, you know, bring in, and even if one or two entrepreneurs set up an office, you know, it, the, it was proving the model was working step by step. Um, and it wasn't just me, there were many other voices and amazing initiatives that were also part of that plan that were, were at that event that weren't necessarily a delegate on the trip. They were also part of the ecosystem. So nobody questioned why they were there, but they too were there. Um, and lovely people, they were all had their purpose. So again, no one looked at me like there she is, um, except for obviously the insecure ones that just, well, that's a different discussion. 
Thank you. Can I, say, I think your enthusiasm for London certainly comes across today, so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Just to um, clarify that point you were just saying, on all these trade missions that you are involved with, officially or unofficially, the ones you went along to unofficially, there were lots of other people there. You described it as the ecosystem. So that was just kind of the way it was. Lots of people came along. You're all passionate about tech. Not a world I really know much about, but you're all there. And, and that was just kind of how it happened, whichever city it was. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Especially London entrepreneurs that would nest, they would either have a business partner or an office in Singapore. I mean, they wouldn't even be on the trade mission, but their, their team would be invited to come to the event. Um, there were several people I got to invite that were entrepreneurs in that space, a data scientist who later came to London and joined Barclays. I mean, there were lots of people that I got to bring. Now, he's, I mean, he needs no introduction when that, that man stands on his own feet. But it was, what I'm saying is these, these kind of, this melting pot, this community that would, you know, hey, you're in Malaysia. I'm in Malaysia. Why don't you come along? You know, there's a dinner here. We're, you know, we're meeting other entrepreneurs. Um, that was kind of the tone. And of course, it was always exciting to see the London folk abroad. Really, this is the secret. I'll tell you why. This is what made it so magical. Because every time in London, everyone's too busy. Everyone's so maxed out. And but when you're abroad, when everybody goes like from Barclays and the banks and all these you know different spaces inside the tech ecosystem, from the corporate to the startup to the politicians and those that work in the private public sector, when you all go to Singapore together, suddenly it becomes so much fun to discover the city together that, you know, there's a bonding experience that happens. And there, that, that's why, you know, you want people that are going to stand front and center and talk to every single person that attends your events, which I did, yeah. you know, and I would stand and talk to everybody as I was so excited. But the access you could get, you know, access as I could speak to, you know, talking there was no exclusivity at that time. Maybe there's metrics now in which to define the parameters of who gets to attend what. Mm. Now, certainly at the time, there were certain venture capital breakfasts or things that would happen targeting specific companies. And that's to the merit of London and partners who worked personally one by one with each and every company. So they would set up specific things for, per, you know, specific invites. But for the most part, if there was an event about celebrating London, they wanted all hands on deck, all cheerleaders, come out, come on, you know, bring out everybody that's going to help us sell this city. Because you have to remember, the time was super exciting for London to be a part of this. It sounds, quite frankly, like you're working for London and Partners. Seems you're doing half their work for them. But it sounds they sound wild, wild times, I have to say. Let's. Um, I've got a colleague who wants to come in. Somebody remember Sahota. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in your view, were these transmissions effectively managed and organised, and uh, and were they well run? Were they, uh, sorry, you broke up. Were they organized and well run? Yes. Is that your question? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And even the ones where you, you felt like, okay, what's going on here? We have some downtime. I mean, there was never any, here's the point. In Singapore, you know, if you had some downtime, you'd go to the zoo or you'd go explore the city. But for the most part, these, the women and the team that were set up to build these trade mission, I mean, they really went all out. And they would go a few days early just to make sure all hangups were, you know, buses, transport, all the logistics were taken care of. And it, you know, it doesn't just happen that way. So, and I think when you put together and you really handpick the people who are attending these events to make sure that not only there's a commercial value for both London and what we're showing the rest of the world, but as humans that these people can really, you know, get together that, I mean, these guys, they did such an amazing job. And that's why they loved my events, because my events connected humans and brought us together. And, you know, and, and so having me allow, you know, on those, you know, come to events and things, especially with my enthusiasm for London, just made sense for them. And to your point, outside of t being on their payroll and having an office, I mean, I worked very closely with them. And I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Assemblymember Hall. Thank you. Oh, Jennifer, I wish I'd been around at that time. Your enthusiasm. Aww. I just 
wish I'd been part of it because it sounds very exciting and I'm sure you're happy to be able to have put some of the records straight and I'm certainly pleased to have heard it. And I have to tell you, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being an aggressive and persistent um, person in order to get your own way and you've obviously done that and that is why you're a successful uh, female entrepreneur. Um, I was going to ask you about the governance arrangements, but I think it's a bit of a waste of time. I think clearly when you were in there, things were very different to how they are now. We had uh, four businesses represented in the first section before you came, and I asked all of them if they had actually introduced anybody to London and Partners, and they hadn't. They were the beneficiaries of London and Partners connections. But listening to you, it sounds like you did introduce lots of your connections and businesses to London and Partners. Is that correct? Well, just, yes, and I, I, I did actually see that. And, you know, to the, the entrepreneurs, they specifically had a remit, you know, launch my app, grow my user base on my app, bring in, you know, X amount of advertisement or investment, et cetera, per their remit of their specific entrepreneur, you know, their, their startup. My startup just so happened to be Build London, you know, Build London Tech Seed. I mean, that's exactly what I did. That's all my events were ever about. You know, how do we build this amazing ecosystem, package it on a video and stream it out so that everybody can see just what we are doing here and how excited we are about it. London and Partners loved my enthusiasm. Obviously, that that matched their remit very much. So it didn't. It never at once, you know, at least at that time, was it weird for them to say, Jennifer, do you know anybody at Bloomberg in San Francisco? I mean, I mean, Penny. There were an amazing team in San Francisco already a part of London and Partners. But what I'm saying is, they they all they all attended the events with me. And we were connecting, okay, so who do we know in education? Who do we know here? All right, let's put together a panel. You know, let's talk about law enforcement. Let's talk about entrepreneurship visas and, you know, what, what we can do to build that. Um, and that's how I worked with London and Partners. Um, they were very close. You know, we were all very close because this, it was so small. You know, and, and when you get to walk around the block and be part of a community and then walk to another pub and then walk to another pub and then end up at my flat, and have a go around the pole, then you know it makes it makes everybody have a good time and think, wow, this is real. We're part of something special here, right. and that's the community we have. I'm green with envy, from pub to pub to back home in a pole. Goodness me! <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever do it again, you know who to phone, don't you? Get me down there. Wonderful. I can't wait for you to come. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me, how did this affect your business? Were you able yes. to build your own business with um, all this enthusiasm as well? Did you, did you, did you benefit from this? Uh, yes and no. I mean, keep in mind, when I, when I started in OTAC, I was a, you know, a straight off the boat, you know, entrepreneur student in an MBA program. I really didn't learn, I didn't know much. But over that year, I learned how this was not only a, a chance of a lifetime, but amongst all this tradition and, fo you know, you had this crazy, cool, innovative space that was happening. And that was really what motivated me to stay and be a part of London. Now, was InnoTech a scalable business? No way. <laughs> it revolved around me, you know, going to events nonstop, you know, 47 events a week. You know, it was just constant. And when you're 20 something and a student, it works. But as I was trying to find what I had launched and built it into something scalable, a piece of software. So I tried with Playbox. I tried, you know, I built a, a, tra a tech training portal with Hacker House. My passion has always been the cyber development of, of these young people, the skill set there. So I was looking for something that was actually a, a, something that you do once and scale many times. You know, my events were the vehicle that put me on the map in London because they were infectious and very well attended and everybody who's anybody came to them. So that people were excited to be a part of them. They weren't like, oh, weird, she's that weird girl. Unless they were like, wait a minute, I need to be part of what this is, you know, this discussion is because look, we're at the Houses of Parliament. We're at level 39. You know, we're at Holborn at the Grand, Con I mean, we, we were in fantastic venues that screamed London's 
his best of the best. We weren't in some dark basement. So this is where it did help my business. Now, ultimately, like most entrepreneurs, I had to pivot into something that would scale. And that's where the hacker house focus and direction into cybersecurity, you know, and, and becoming a mom, you know, full disclosure, um, that, that kind of took me away from the active events business and, business and like most ecosystems, they're not going to stay, you know, infantile for long. They will start developing and the needs of those companies will change. So I didn't think I needed to continue on uh, what I was doing because by the time 2016 had hit, you know, we already had a thriving tech community. You know, I could have continued on. I had my daughter. Yes, and children always come first. We all understand that. Thank you very much. Your enthusiasm mm -hmm. is infectious, and uh, I'm very pleased to have heard your story. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Paul. Could, could I just um, pick up that, fight, that point you said that this whole, you know, all of you are out, pubs to pubs, back to your flat. Did that include people from London and partners or just from the tech sector? Sure. At times, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. I've got one more member, um, Assembly Member Cooper, who will appear on the screen, I assume. I hope so. Hi. Hi, Jennifer. It's uh, Leonie here. Can you, can you hear me? Because I'm online. Oh, we can well, see like, you now. Hi. Okay. Yeah. So like Susan, obviously, um, yeah, so I think it's very unusual actually having, um, fintech entrepreneurs, um, who, uh, are like you, I think, uh, probably fairly thin on the ground. I'm having met a few now. Um, you don't have to comment on, uh, on your rival entrepreneurs in your sector, but, um, I think you probably know. And I think you have also, I think you describe yourself as fearless on your Twitter, but you have been quite, um, clear with us um you know and very open about um you know a number of the things that you've done i think you described yourself as hustling for example which i guess some people wouldn't wouldn't say about themselves and so one of the roles of uh, london and partners um which i think was a much younger organization in the time that we're um discussing was it has been to do inward investment into london and to build those links around the world and has now got a network of offices in a number of places and i just wondered if you could say to us how successful you think your involvement was with london and partners both in terms of increasing its profile for example you were saying gosh if you just turned up in new york and you weren't sorted you'd be eating for breakfast that kind of thing how, how much do you think you were able to help london and partners increase its profile and get that inward investment into london What a question. Well, by no means can I take credit for any of the team that were properly part of London and Partners. I mean, I was a wannabe at best, a groupie. You can go ahead and call me that. Um, <laughs> because the reality is I just loved London. They knew I wasn't going away. They knew I wasn't going to take no for an answer. And I was going to do whatever it took to build my business. They loved that. And they you know, definitely utilized that. Um, so the value that I could bring would was to, you know, I, I eventually went on to run a cyber TLA tech London advocates event, you know, so I would do that in conjunction with other TLA London and partners events, both in London and abroad, I could bring some really awesome speakers. I mean, people you wouldn't normally find every day on your bulletin. And I would also, because of my ability to, you know, could bring in law enforcement or other places, uh, pieces of the pie. You know, I was I was producing an event in San Francisco with the mayor's team over there and the governor, you know, the deputy governor um, in Sacramento. So that they liked that I had already made introduction in places that you know they too either didn't know um, or, or were still building on. You know, especially in San Francisco because you have to go in with your wolf pack. I mean, you go out there on your own and I'm an American, you'll get eaten alive. So you want to go with the, you know, this, I am London. I am part, you know, I know the people in London and partners, UKTI. I met, you know, Sam Evans out there. I met the team of one. So it was very, um, and you know, most of our entrepreneurs were going once a week back and forth between London and San Francisco. So I was a great value in that respect um, of being another entrepreneur on the ground that could either feed up honest feedback about certain things 
or you know uh, help them recruit more of the entrepreneurs. But let me be very clear: with or without me, this team would have done you know well. They were great in their own mind. I am no by no means trying to steal their spotlight because I remember those teams in those early days with London and Partner, and a lot of those women did everything they could to be awesome and amazing for the tech community, and they deserve that credit. So I I don't want to steal that their. I'm absolutely not trying to take credit away from from but I think it does help doesn't it if you've got someone new um as you were saying you know I, I don't know how many of the staff at London and Partners that were American at that time or indeed are American now I haven't met any that up there are but I think it does help doesn't it if you have someone who you know is able to communicate in that way because although we can very easily speak to each other uh, because we're all speaking English but it's, there's a definite difference, isn't there, in terms of the way of communication. And I just think that maybe that was something that you were able to bring to the party to add to, you know, what they were doing. Oh, for sure. For, mm. Especially after, I mean, my, let me tell you, jaws were on the floor when we managed to get that Google Hangout on air with San Francisco and Bloomberg, you know. And, and uh, it was during a UKTI, London is great, a week in L.A., so, I mean, everyone's like, how did that happen? And we were really, you know, all excited at the edge of our seat. So, you know, that event alone especially got people going, what's in London? Who's in London? Let's go there. You know, they're so cool. They throw these really great, amazing Google Hangouts and check out their mayor. You know, there were all that kind of stuff that happened as a result of that event. And it really, I mean, it, it opened no doors. I mean, I needed no introduction. I was this crazy American girl obsessed with London. Full stop. <laughs> so that was that kind of became your USP to to a certain degree. Yeah. So I just want to ask you. I've got another question. I'd just like to follow up with, which is, if you were giving advice to entrepreneurs, they don't have to be women, but just entrepreneurs in general. They don't have to be young women, because obviously you were at that time as well. You know, as you said in your twenties. If you were giving advice to entrepreneurs to improve their chances of, um, you know, promoting a big city, getting involved in trade missions, you just described all the links that were set up all of those sorts of things what what would you advise people and obviously it could be about their personality putting themselves across but other things never ever ever give up <laughs> no matter how many times you hear no you just keep going tell them you'll find another way to get them to say yes and keep going because that is what it takes as a female entrepreneur especially in a new country <laughs> You know, so you you just you cannot let people's emotions or opinions or words affect you. You pick your focus and you stay linear to it. And no matter what happens, you manifest it until the very end. Let me tell you, that is so the biggest learning curve I've ever learned in London, because I was producing an event at the Grand Connaught Hill, Grand Connaught Rooms, with a twenty-five thousand pound bill that I had not a clue how we were going to cover. And we, we, we produced it. And by the end of the day, the bill was paid. Um, but that's, that takes the perseverance and de determination to never, ever give up. Wow. So if, even at the risk of annoying people, you just make sure that you just carry on. That really, because you, know, you were talking about being, you know, hustling and being fearless. So, yeah, that's part of the deal. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Caroline, and thank you very much, Jennifer, for joining in. I'm not quite sure what time it is where you are, but it's very good of you to be with us. Thank you. One more, guys, are coming. Lovely. <laughs> Any more questions? I think that comes to the end of our session. Thank you so much, um, Jennifer, for joining us um, from the US to answer our questions today. I think we've all been... Um, taken aback by your energy and enthusiasm and it's been really refreshing to hear from you and hear your your side of this and also to get some answers to our questions for our inquiries so thank you so much for taking the time today we really really appreciate it um, you're free to leave the meeting now i've got some formal business with um, my colleagues to do so can we note the reporter's background to put in questions and delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with the deputy chairman and party group lead members to agree any output from this meeting agreed and agreed. item five um, can we note this committee's work program for the next Good year Good lovely Good. date of our next meeting it's not next week, folks. <laughs> it's Tuesday, the 2nd of November at 10 in the morning. I look forward you're, to seeing you you're all You're slipping, then. Caroline. You're slipping. I know. I know. I'll get another one in somewhere. Um, any other business? There's nothing urgent. Thank you, all members and our guests this afternoon. Thank you.